Good morning. Good morning. Wow. <laughs> Did I mess that up? Good evening, Calvary family and visitors. Thank you for tuning in this Wednesday evening as we get into the Word of God. And we just want you to settle down. Make sure you get some communion elements. We'll see how far we get in our study this evening. But let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 5. Solomon builds the temple. Solomon, as you're turning there and preparing your communion elements, I'll just inform you real quickly that Solomon, of course, is on the throne as we've been uh, studying, and he's become quite the, the man of wisdom, the man of study. Uh, we mentioned last week just how quickly, how speedily that he, uh, is that a word? It is now that he uh, obtained knowledge in different areas. I mean, all he asked God was for wisdom to rule the, the kingdom. He, he, he was humble at that point, and God blessed him uh, above he could, uh, uh, what he could ever think. Uh, he is a, a doctor of science and, and uh, all kinds of different studies that he has uh, been able to uh, you know, learn and become proficient in. And now it's time for him to get involved in building the temple. He begins first, of course, to prep for the building of the temple. And it has come at a time, and it is about time, isn't it? It's about God's time. When you study the scriptures, when you read through the Bible, we tend to miss that. But everything happens, for the most part, for the good, for the blessing, in God's good timing. That goes not only for this temple to be built, but we know even for when the Lord came to earth, at the time of Christmas, it was the right time, the time. It was the time when he was to go to the cross. It was the time that was appointed for him by God. And nothing is different here. This project, this temple project, was all about time and time for God to, to raise up a king and time for that King David to have a son and time for that son to grow and time for that son to have the wisdom of God and now time for him to build a house of God or for God. So in 1 Kings chapter 5, look in there. I hope you're ready. Let's pray. And ask God to bless this service. So, Father, thank you for the worship, Lord, that prepares our heart, God, that prepares our heart to hear from you. And that's what we ask, Lord. Nothing in your Bible is filler. We, we want to glean everything that we can tonight, God, as we walk through these chapters. Speak to us, God, in Jesus' name. And all the household set, amen, and the few people here. God bless you guys for serving, by the way. Thank you. Well, there in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now, Haram, king of Tyre, sent his servant to Solomon because he heard that he had anointed him, that he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always loved David. Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know, how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side. It was not until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. Does that sound familiar, my friends? It wasn't until God put the, his foes, his enemies, the soles under his feet as a footstool. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to my father David saying, Your son whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. And, and, and this is, you know, a text message. This is a, a message we could say that Solomon in hearing from Haram, reminded him, and I don't think this was a coincidence, that this is the guy that helped my dad build his, his own place, his palace. And this is a good friend of my father. 
The king of Tyre provided workers and materials to help David over in 2 Samuel 5. And now Solomon calls upon the king to help him build the temple. That's smart. That's wise. This project, we can say, though, was underwritten by David in many, many ways, as we've been showing you. Through all the wars he fought, he is the one who really brought peace to the land. And yet Solomon gets to rejoice and enjoy the, the fruits of his father's labor. David, who, who knew he couldn't build it, he couldn't build the house of God, but he could finance the project and, and, and give to Solomon, give to Solomon the blessings of the finances that he was able to to collect and not only that but uh the other things that he needed i mean he gave to solomon 38,000 tons of silver 4,050 tons of gold and tons of bronze and wood and precious stones he also gave to his son listen the blueprints he gave him the, the blueprints to the temple for this temple was to be built by god's design by god's design not man's design but by God's design. Also, the furnishings and all the things that God wanted this, this complex, this, this building to look like, this house. He gave to David. First Chronicles 28 uh, tells us that. It's there in the 19th verse of 28 of the First Chronicles. It says, all this, speaking of the plans, the Lord made me understand in writing, says David, by his hand upon me, all the works of these plans. So God gave David the plans. He, he blessed David with the wealth, with the finances, with, the, with, with the, everything that, that Solomon would need to build it. But David, you can't build it because you have blood on your hands. You're, you're a man of war. So this was not a human design, but a divine design by God, providing his creation and his people to build through the leadership of Solomon. It's always great when, when you have somebody underwriting your ministries. Well, when you have somebody blessing you, right, missionaries? When somebody's blessing you, you know, and you're able to go do ministry, it's always a blessing. And, and hence, this is what David or Solomon is, 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 is experiencing. Uh, Solomon wanted to build a temple with excellence, and that's the way you go about doing God's work, with excellence. Should be nothing, nothing less than excellence to the best of our ability. And so he continued the royal friendship with Hiram, his father's friend, and he enlisted his help in this great project of God. And now verse 6, it says, Now therefore, command they, that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants, according to whatever you say, for you know there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. So it gives us an insight that they were really a, a, a people of craft, a people of artistic ability. They were just people who were just great at this. But it, Lebanon was known at that time, and I, I don't see why it still isn't. It was known for its excellent forests, of wood and, and cedars. Cedars were the best of the woods to use in a building. And, and Solomon knows that. Remember, he, he, he's an, uh, what do you call that? Arabus, uh, a tree expert. Arborist, that's what I said. Arabus is the same thing, but it's in a different language. He was an arborist, so he understood the, the quality of wood. And so here he wants to use that type of wood for the temple. Well, Hiram's response, and notice this in verse 7. So it was when Hiram uh, heard the words of Solomon, notice that he rejoiced greatly. I mean, he's just rejoicing over this. And look, look what he said. Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. Man, I, I, I got to say this. We, we find out, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, that this king of Tyre, he's a believer. He's a believer. Hiram shows us that there is joy in the work of the Lord and for the Lord as he breaks out in praise. Man, God, you're too much. You're going to use me. You're going to use 
my ability, my leadership, my gift of helps, if you would, to help Solomon, the new king. Praise the Lord that God has put another like David in his place, he says. You know, I can't overemphasize the importance of praise and worship, of prayer before we serve the Lord. And in music, yes, but not so much in music, but a quiet time, a time of prayer, a time of reading and preparing yourself for the work at hand. We should never go into ministry or any kind of service for the Lord until we have at least, you know, on the, on the drive over to church or whatever the case may be, that we turn off the radio and just start worshiping God, thanking him. Put on, put on some scripture verses on the radio or put on, on a CD. Get prepared. Get yourself prepared. And this guy, he just breaks out in worship. Both leaders had a generous amount of wealth and materials available for them. But most importantly, please don't miss this, they both served who? The Lord. They both served the Lord. They're like-minded. They're united in faith. That's even more of a blessing. Now, God can use the world, and God can use uh, other people in the world uh, if he wants to, to do his will. But what a great thing it is when two like-minded men in a position of leadership, high leadership, that love the Lord, man. Isn't that great? I just think it's cool. They had his blessings. They had his plans. They had God's plans for this temple. And really, to think about it, it all belonged to the Lord anyway, right? It all did. So verse 8, moving on, he says that, Then Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and the cypress logs. I, I, will, I will give to you what you need amongst the forests that I oversee of Lebanon. He says, my servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will float them, notice this, in rafts by sea to the place you indicate to me. And that place was Joppa, by the way. We'll have a, a, a map here in a minute. And we'll have them broken apart there. Then you can take them away, and you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my household. David, just feed my people. So here we find out more about this king this king of Tyre. Not only is he a believer, not only, not only is he finds joy to do the work of the Lord, but he's willing to help him. He's willing. And here in 2 Chronicles 2.16, we find out in, in, in the corresponding book of what we're studying in 1 Kings that the rafts that were put together of this great wood would go from Lebanon and float down to the sea to Joppa. Second Chron Chronicles 2.16 says, And we will cut wood from Lebanon as much as you need. We will bring it to you in rafts by sea to Joppa. And if you notice Joppa, you know, there's a, it's about a 90-mile, uh, uh, um, nautical miles, I guess, whatever you want to call it, uh, via the Med Mediterranean Sea to Joppa. And they were able to maneuver that. Hundreds and hundreds of rafts of these great trees, these cypress, these, these trees that are coming down. But they would stop there in Joppa. And from Joppa, they would then disassemble the, ra the rafts and they would take the wood and they would take it down 35 miles, I should say, up to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem, by the way, out of respect. And so this is the way they planned to do it. And, it, and apparently it worked. It worked. And so it just, it's just awesome. And so verse 10 through 12, he goes on to say, Then Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. Imagine that. According to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food, or I could say 100,000 bushels of wheat and 110 gallons of pressed oil. And Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. And then the Lord gave Solomon wisdom. I want you to notice that. As he had promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty together. Can two walk together without being like-minded, without, you know, being in partnership? 
And, and here we see that the third chord here is God. Here we see the, the, the partnership here, working together, loving God together, serving God together, and God in the middle of it all, man. And the thing is, is that Hiram gave to Solomon, Solomon gave to Hiram, how you say his name, and the Lord gave. I mean, this, we see here just a, a giving spirit here. We, we, we see a given spirit, and, and what it brings is peace. And guys, the key to a life of generosity is in a heart that delights in the Lord. I mean, here it is, you know, they're just giving one to another as God has given to them. As I said, it's all God's anyway. He owns everything. And this giving spirit, you know, as the Lord kept his promise, so, so too these two men of faith kept theirs to each other. For where God guides, you know this, God provides. And he provides through the hands of faithful and generous worshipers. He provides through us, guys. And he guides us. And he directs us. And it's just wonderful here. So we see in verse 13 through 18, Solomon puts together a labor force. Once he gets the word saying, absolutely, let's do this. Let's do this for the Lord, man. We're in. You know, I love that as other churches are doing things and we're doing things and we invite other churches. Hey, we're in, man. That's a great cause. That's a, that's a great ministry, man. You count us in. Or as we pray about missionaries or other ministries out in, out in the world or, or in the States or across the street, whatever the case may be, we come together and the leadership, yeah, that's a great work. Let's, hey, I want in on that. I want to I wanna bless them. Let's, let's do that. But he puts together a labor force. Look at verse 13 here. Then the king Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. Imagine that. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. It's, Solomon is wise, you see. He knows if he sends them there for any longer than that, that they would begin to miss home, and they would begin to perhaps... You know, you know, just just the, the, the labor force, the work, the, the excellence there, that, that it would work against them. So he's very, he's very wise as he puts these ships, shifts together. They were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. It's like if you were in, uh, like a lot of the police departments and the fire departments, so you work a week and you've got two weeks off. You know, uh, it really motivates you when you come back because you're ready and charged and ready to go. He put Ad, Ad, Adon Ram in charge. We learned about that guy in, 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 in Solomon's staff in charge of the labor force. And Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains, besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the people. You needed supervision, the people who labored and worked. Verse 17, and the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the temple. So Solomon's builders, Haram's builders, the Gebelites, even they came along, uh, uh, quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. I want you to notice this, though. Have you noticed that both Jew and Gentile were involved in this temple? I will send my people over to work with your people. Your work people work with us, you know. And, and here we're seeing that the temple, from the foundation all the way up, that the temple here, guys, is being built by both Jew and Gentile. And I believe this is what God wanted. I believe this is what God wanted, a temple not only for Israel, but also for the Gentiles to involve themselves in building and worshiping of the Lord through it. Isaiah 56, 6 and 7 speaks of the foreigner who joins himself to the Lord, that they're invited to the house of the Lord. He says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And unfortunately, after this temple was built, the Gentile didn't even get an invitation to the grand opening or any invitation to worship the Lord. And it wouldn't be until Herod rebuilds the temple that a court will be built for the Gentile. But even that, as we find in the times of Christ, that they use that court of the Gentiles to allow the Gentiles to come and worship God, well, it was a swap meet. It was a place, it was like a marketplace. It had the stench of animal, um, 
dung and, and, and urine. And, and, and remember how Jesus went in there. He just cleaned the, cleaned the place out. But what this does to me when I see these Jews and Gentiles working together to build a temple points to the church today where there is neither Jew or Gentile, but believers united together in building God's kingdom. Don't miss seeing that in this. Now we go to 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 through 10. Here we see that they began to build the outer structure, the house, if you would, the, the outer structure. In verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build a house of the Lord. So it says here, 480 years, it says, it came to pass after the children of Israel had come out of the land. Now, don't, let's not forget that 40 of those years was a year, 40 years of wandering. So 440 years in country, in Canaan, in the Holy Land, four years after Solomon's coronation, the construction of the temple begins. God is so precise. He wants everything written down. And then he gives us the length there in verse 2 of the temple proper, the shell, like I said. He says, now the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. I did the math for you. The, vest, the vegetable, no, the vestibule, the portico, the entryway, I call it the vegetable. It's easier to say. It, it, it's that which is front of the sanctuary of the house was 30 feet long across the width of the house. And you probably are seeing a... Uh, we have that. There you go. Just keep that up for a while, please. You can see the, the vestibule there. And um, it's in front of the uh, sanctuary of the house. And it was 30 feet long across the width of the house. And the width of the vestibule extended 15 feet from the front of the house. In verse 4, he speaks of these beveled window frames. And this is interesting. Uh, God wanted windows now in this temple, the hard structure. We know that the, the tabernacle was, was just a tent. It was a, it was a common tent that was built uh, for God, for God's people to worship. But now in his plans, he had these beveled frames, these window frames. And verse five through six, it speaks of the chambers. These were storerooms. Uh, uh, they were adjacent to the temple, surrounded it on the north, west, and south sides. And these side chambers were built in three stories, as you can see there in the illustration we have for you. You know, there were just the rooms needed for, for you know, like we, in our project here in our building, we built out. We were blessed to have got into this building. The one thing that we never counted on or was storage. Man, I'm telling you, storage, and everybody's trying to take every piece of, of storage we have, every ministry, you know. But, uh, but we need more storage, man. So anyway, that's what really what these were for storages. And then verse 7, I, I want to look at verse 7 because it speaks of Solomon's quarry. Look at verse 7. It says, And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. So we could say in a sense that this temple, as it was being crafted and built, was almost like a fabric home. You ever see those fabric homes on the freeway? You may see them, you know, driving it. It's, it's, it's put together on the lot. It's already built, but it's just put together. I'm not talking about a triple wide or the actual home. They, they, they fabricate it in... in uh, shop, uh, you know, and then they, they bring it, they carry it to the place where, it, to your lot. The stone blocks had to be precisely cut. You guys know this, uh, to size, so they would fit together when assembled. The carvings, the chippings, the grindings were to be done at the quarry outside and away from the Temple Mount, which kind of blew me away as I was studying this, is that for us as temples of the Holy Spirit, you know that the work was done outside of Jerusalem on a hill called Calvary. Not a quarry, but Calvary. 
by God himself, placed on a wooden cross. And I was trying to find out what kind of wood Rome used for this, uh, this uh, apparatus of pain, excruciating pain. What kind of wood did they use? And uh, many scholars believe it was some of that wood from Lebanon that they could use because they had to use it over and over and over again. But I just give you that to study on your own. But salvation, guys, came not by works. Salvation came not by any worldly chisel or axe or hammer. None of that could save us. None of us could, that can make us his temple. It came by one work and one work alone. And as we continue to tell you, it's the work that was done in Calvary by Jesus Christ outside the Temple Mount, outside of the wall. You remember that, where they, where they took him. Well, moving on in verse 11 through 13, right in the middle of the project, as they're just finishing, you know, the, the outside of the temple, as they're putting some of the finishing touches about to go inside, about to go in, into the, the actual sanctuary itself, all of a sudden, Solomon gets a word from the Lord. Look at there in verse 11. Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments. Wait a minute, God, you already told me this. And walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Solomon had heard this already. God already spoke this to him when he became king. And now in the middle of a project, in a sense, God stops to work, if I could say. He says, Solomon, come into my office. I want to talk to you. And it reminds him. He reminds him of what God required of Solomon in all of this. As Solomon is halfway in completing the temple, God speaks to him basically, again, the same words that he spoke to him earlier when he began to rule as king. What's that? Why is that? Well, you know, he needed to be reminded of this project. And many of us can get like this. We get into a project, a building project. We get into a new ministry or we get into a new work. And man, we're all about the work. But sometimes God has to set us down again and remind us, this is my work. This is what I want. This is going to glorify me. And I want to still use you. But don't forget, worship me. Spend some time with me. Don't lose your, your, your direction. Don't, don't, don't forget to look up. Don't forget to know why you're doing this and who's anointed you and empowered you and strengthened you to do this. And, and he just wants to get this word out to Solomon. I think of Paul as we're in the book of Philippians on Sunday mornings when we get to chapter 3 where Paul will say in verse 1, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I like that. I never get tired of telling you these things. Now notice this. I do it to safeguard your faith. God wants to safeguard Solomon. Continue to remind him, Solomon. Don't forget, Solomon, this is what I expect of you. You're leading this group. You're leading this crew. Yeah, you got supervised, but they're looking to you. And I've put you in a place that you cannot forget. And I'm going to remind you continually to safeguard your faith. 2 Peter 1.12 will say, Therefore, I always remind you about these things, things of the Spirit, the things of the Lord, the things that we need as we grow in Christ. Even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth, you have been taught. Guys, we study the Word of God, and many times in the Word of God, you're going to get the same. Some people say, man, he's on the same topic. It's, you know, I've been here for three weeks, and it's been almost the same thing. Well, maybe God's trying to get your attention. I don't know. I just study whatever God gives to me, man. This is a spiritual well check for Solomon. It is not so much about a building that God is concerned but about the ministry, man. It's not about a building. Does God really live in a building? The building is for the people. 
God is interested in Solomon's heart, his faith. God is interested in the people that he's leading, being the right leader that they need, keeping the vision alive, the direction. Verse 14 says, so Solomon built the temple and finished it. This is his first finish. He finished the outer structure, the shell. Now he goes into the inner building and it begins. And and again, I think this is why God stopped. You're starting to build a very important portion of this temple. And I've got to remind you, Solomon, the things that you need to be reminded of. He says here that this was... As we know, it was the most important part of this structure, the most important part. It's going to be where the the priests carry out the ministry, lighting the incense and going into the holy place. And, of course, we know once a year going into that holy of holies. In verse 15, he talks about the walls and the floors, how he used cedar boards to panel. In verse 16 through 18, here he speaks of the inner sanctuary. He speaks of the most holy place and how, it is, how he, he builds it. It's, a, it's a really a, it's a 30-foot cube is what it is. He builds this room. And, and, and then verse 19, it speaks again of the inner sanctuary, but the specifics of it, this holy of holy, how he prepares it. And he sets the ark of the covenant of the Lord there. We have a picture here of the ark of the covenant just to remind you the ark represented the throne of God. It was a chest, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, 27 inches high, and it was covered with gold and contained two tablets of the law. The lid on top of this chest, that lid that you see where the two cherubs are facing each other, it contained the tablets of the law. Isn't that interesting? Inside, it contained the tablets of the law. In the beginning, it contained other things. But we know the one thing that was always there was the word of God. There was supposed to be Aaron's rod, right? And, uh, and uh, some manna. Whether those things were there, we do know one thing. That the word of God would always be in that chest. Because the word of God lives forever. And so it would be once a year, as I said, that the high priest was permitted to enter this place that he is now building. He's... He's, he's building it out. And he would go there to sprinkle blood on that mercy seat, that lid, which would cover the sins of all, not the individual. The individual sinner, the individual worshiper will come on his own when needed. But once a year, he would go in that holy of holies, that holy place that he is building at this point, and he would cover, he would put blood on the seat, It would cover the sins of all the people who broke God's commandments for another year. And it shows that nobody could keep the commandments that man falls short. And it continued to look forward to the one who would be the offering for us to cover us completely by his blood. In verse 20 to 22, we talk again of this inner sanctuary. He gives you the, the, the whole measurement of it. And in verse 23 to 28, he talks about these two big, huge angels, these two cherubim. I mean, he just goes into it. Again, we have it on that illustration. You can see it. I hope you can see it at home. They're huge. They're 15 feet high. They're seven and a half feet. Um, um, with their wings are seven and a half feet each. Um, I mean, it's just this huge, these two cherubim that will sit in front of the Ark of the Covenant. It just brings the, the importance the, uh, of the holiness of God, you see. And then we have in verse 29 to 32, the artistic carvings. You know, if you're an artist, praise God, especially if you're an artist for the Lord. And you begin to, you're, you're, you're utilizing your art, uh, you know, for God. You know, you can utilize it for, you know, financial uh, um, blessings and things like that as well. And, you know, but, but, but your heart is to, to be an artist for God. And, and, and here we see that even all the way down to the, to the 
you know, just, just a, um, a pomegranate or, or, or a flower. Uh, God was all about the details. Second Chronicles 3.10 tells us that Solomon hung a beautiful veil inside these doors that marked off the Holy of Holies, the, the inner sanctuary from the sanctuary. You know, you know that, um, that veil, that's the veil that tore from top to bottom when Herod rebuilt the temple. It was that veil that tore when Christ gave up his spirit unto his father on the cross where the temple no longer was needed. It became null and void. Where it was at that point where man can go directly to God. Because Jesus, all that Jesus, he's our mediator. He's the one. We can go directly to God now. There's no curtain. There is no cherubim. There, you know, and, but, but Jesus was our mercy seat. Jesus fulfilled all the illustrated illustrations of each piece that can, was contained, everything that was contained, the, 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 the lighting, the, the, you know, all of that. Verse 33 through 34 speaks of the, of the sanctuary, speaks of the cypress wood, speaks of the paneling and things like that. And then in verse 36, he speaks of the entrance in front of the temple, the inner court, how it was laid. And then he says that the house was finished, verse 38, in the 11th year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its details according to his plans. I like that. Don't miss that. Again, God is about details. God is about having his plan laid out the way he lays it out. It says, so he was seven years in building it. The building of the temple from the foundation to the finishing nail, down to the last nail, took seven years and six months to complete. And then we come to chapter 7, quickly, the temple furnishings, in verses 1 through 12. And I, I hope you read ahead. If not, go, please read ahead. That spoke now. It's interesting. He speaks of his own house. Uh, Solomon made the temple a priority, though and showed the building of his house, uh, excuse me, slowed the building of his house, that would take six more years to complete after his palace. But the priority was the temple. He needed a house to live in, I guess. He even built a little room in the back for, a, for any future wives. Unfortunately, that, we'll get to that. Verses 13 to 14 speaks of a man by Hiram who was a skilled bronze artisan. He was a master workman of Jewish lineage who lived in Tyre. It speaks again of how God uses what's in man's hand, what's in your hand. Is it a pen? Is it a, is it a pencil? Is it a chisel? Is it a hammer? What is in it? Can God use it? Give it to God. Jesus said to this young boy, What's in your hands? Only two fishes and, and some bread. Give it to me and let me use it. And we saw, we know the story of that, right? He told Moses, what's in your hand? I'm going to use it for your ministry that I'm calling you to. In verse 15 to 22, we have a, uh, go back to the, to the illustration. We have two pillars, two pillars of bronze stood at the entrance of the temple. One was named Jackin or Jackin meaning he shall establish, and the other, Boaz, meaning in him is strength. The house of God was a place where people were reminded of the God of whom they served. And as they would come to the temple, there right there, guys, you can see it, were the two pillars, these two bronze pillars, just right there to remind you guys that it's God that we serve, that it's God who established our, their relationship with him and God who was the source of their strength. They were constantly being reminded when they looked at those two pillars. Today, we are reminded of our relationship where our strength comes from through the communion table, the cross where Jesus suffered and died, establishing our relationship with him who was buried and rose again, establishing our strength in his resurrection, overcoming death and decay. 
replacing fear with faith, replacing, you know, the, uh, you know, bringing joy instead of sorrow, replacing sorrow for joy. He's our strength. He's the one who established a relationship. We're the one who responded. We responded to his love. Verses 23 to 26 speak of the, the sea. Again, we go to the illustration. The bronze basin were to be used by the, really the priest to wash himself before entering the temple. We have the 10 carts and the 10 lavers. A laver is a basin. It's a basin, you can see them there, that would contain water. And these basins would be placed on carts that was uh, mobile, had four wheels on them. And these lavers were also used by priests to wash themselves as they're going through the, the, the procedure with the animals, the bleeding of the animal and, 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 and the blessing of that. Um, in verses 40 through 47 of chapter 7, it speaks of just the whole inventory of the cast bronze. It just goes through all the inventory, all that this artisan, Haram, cast and fashioned in brass. In verses 48 to 51, it speaks of the gold furnishings for the inner sanctuary. Interesting note, though. Did you notice this? Everything inside of the temple was made of what? Or overlaid of? Gold. Did you notice that? Check me on this. I don't think anything inside you would find brass. I don't think anything inside you would find that will not be overlaid in gold. I couldn't find it. Maybe you can. I don't think so. Because gold, guys is precious, it's valuable, it's pure. And it may speak of God and of God and how precious he is and how pure he is. Of course, we know that. How valuable he is and his presence in our lives. God knows who came up with these plans, who, who was specific in everything from the nail all the way up to the, the pillars that gold is the closest man, gold is the closest Solomon or man can value on earth to show his honor to God, something of a sacrifice to him. As David said when purchasing the threshing floor, remember that? And the mountain that this temple is now being built upon, better known as Mount Moriah, when the owner was willing to give it to David to worship, but David said, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for the 50 shekels of silver, and according to 1 Chronicles 21, 25, also paid 600 shekels of gold for it. He bought the, the threshing floor, he bought the mountain, and he has the receipt for it. It's in the Bible. We showed that last time. Well, guys, I ask you now to read ahead. Chapter 8 is exciting. We're going to dedicate the temple. That's an exciting time, man. Lisa, I like this stuff. I, I, I hope you guys got into it. Get Bibles out. Get illustrations out. Look at them when you're studying. It's very interesting. You know, when you see, also when you see some types, you see Christ in everything. You see God in everything. But, you know, let me just close with this. Psalm 127, 1, Alpha says this. Unless the Lord builds the house, what? That's right. They labor, what? In vain who build it. Unless the Lord builds the house. Think about that. I think we've seen that in all of this that we've studied, that the Lord was building the house. Now, he's building it through Solomon's leadership, Hiram's a partnership, through the artistic uh, blessings of those uh, who Huram and, and others who, who were involved in it. And they went by the book. They went by the plans, by the blueprints of what God wanted. Solomon's temple was the house that God wanted built. Every detail was spelled out. And Solomon saw to it that the design was followed perfectly. But you know what? Someone said, God is not impressed with our buildings for he provides everything to put them in. It's not really about a building, is it? It's about the people. It's about the church. It's about the gathering, isn't it? And unfortunately, right now, we're not able to, to gather, but we will be gathering on Sunday. Make sure you RSVP on our website. 
But he wants our loving obedience. He wants us to serve. He wants us to love. He wants us to humbly use our gifts in that service. And through that love, then he makes the building a blessing. He makes the building a blessing. Because it's to him to give honor and glory to. And as the church gather, the building becomes the church. The building becomes the sanctuary where God is worshipped. And let God build your personal house, your life. As believers, we are temples. So allow him to reign supreme as our king and lord. And as 1 Peter 2, 5 says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice, sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Are you? 1 Peter 2, 5. Take that tonight. Look at it. Ask yourself, Lord, is that, am I doing that? Am I offering up a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to you, Lord? Uh, man, he does some great surgery, doesn't he? He does, man. He humbles us and he blesses us and he, and he, and he convicts us and he, and through his word. So, so if that's not happening, man, get, get quiet with him. Say, Lord, where do you want me? How do you want me serving? How do you want me to help the pastors, the ministry leaders, the elders to make this building a sanctuary, a ministry for others? Amen. Let's go to communion, guys. Get your elements together. Let's go to communion. Let's thank the Lord. Let's remember him. Let's remember what Jesus has done for us. You know, we don't have the pillars. We have the Holy Spirit within us. And God says, go. Go to my table and remember me. Because as, as Paul wrote, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember him. In the same manner, you also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. I love it, the covenant of grace. This do as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Here's our hope till he comes. Let us partake. God bless you guys.
Jesus, the only one who could ever 